All right, let's do a video. Um, I am having a conversation with several people, and I wanted to address this directly because they've been asking questions and making statements. Uh, one of them uh, was sent over here by Almost Home Prophecy Watch to um, try to spread their misunderstandings about the word and and what's going on here. Uh, there, it, this goes a lot deeper than what they even realize. Uh, there are people that are for and against once saved, always saved. There are people that are... Um, some people are floating in the middle uh, because they don't know what this means. So let's put this in the actual perspective it's supposed to be in. Once saved, always saved is not in the Bible. Eternal security is in the Bible. Once saved, always saved is a statement slash acronym that was created to make it fun and easy for people to remember and to make it uh, to draw in more people, draw in more more sinners. Now you've got people like David Wilkerson and many others who call this a uh, doctrine of from hell. Once you're sealed, you're sealed. I have scripture on the screen that shows that. This is where people have to it can't it, they can't grasp the concept of you don't have the power to remove yourself from God's hand. Once you're there, you're there. Here's the problem. The ones that end up going away are the ones that never actually got there. They went right up to it and then turned around and went back. Now, when you get saved, not everybody gets saved right away. It takes a while. There's examples in the Bible about this. See, all this stuff that these people are arguing about all comes from their, their lack of understanding of reading the Bible. Or they just don't read the scriptures that pertain to this. There are examples in the book of Acts and in other epistles that show you does it every time so there are examples in there where it shows there's a blanket right over there going down where it shows people that listen to the gospel nothing changed uh, Acts, Acts 10 is an example listen to the gospel nothing changed listen to um, or we got participated in baptism nothing changed had hands laid on them nothing changed there's, you, there's all kinds of examples of this. They talk about all these people who took off and went out with them, learned from them, and did all this stuff, and then they went out and started doing exactly the opposite of what they were taught. We have that problem going on here. There's a whole camp of people on the other side uh, here on YouTube that are doing that. They, they think they're saved, but listen, I still hold 100% that a person who is truly born again, who has the Holy Spirit in them, cannot willfully accept a false doctrine. You can make a mistake and get caught up in a misunderstanding, but eventually the Holy Spirit's going to be like, hello, it, you need to pay attention. You need to pay attention because this is wrong. And eventually you'll come out of that. You, you're going to grow with the Holy Spirit. Because eventually the, if you get to a point where you're just standing there, the Holy Spirit's just going to push you <laughs> and you're going to go. I know it happened to me. Um, there's a fine, fine line that you cross at salvation. A lot of people get to that line and stop, and they never go any further. So they, this is where you have people that look, walk, talk, smell, act like believers, but they're not believers. The Bible talks about this. There are tons of people that are false converts. They get all of it up here. They never get it in here. We have a lot of people that are doing that. Now, I know this isn't popular to say people are, are, are unsaved or they're not actually saved. Again, I hold to strictly to what the Bible says, that if you're a true believer, if you have the Holy Spirit, these are the fruits. One of those fruits is not to accept a false doctrine. Annihilationism is one of those doctrines. That's a false doctrine. It goes directly against the words of Christ. I showed you this morning, Matthew 25, 46. The very verse they try to use to prove it, uh, disproves it. By the same Greek word that they, that they try to use. They destroy their own argument. But this goes much deeper than that. This comes down to a very deep spiritual and emotional change. Some people it happens, some people it doesn't happen. It's hard to conceptualize that there are people and they do everything just like everybody else did. And they everything happens and ah, they got the experience and they're full and then they get this taste and then go right back to the same life they live. Nothing ever changes. And they'll go like that 10, 20, 30 years, nothing ever changes. How was that person saved? Well, they believe. They have the testimony. Okay. 
why aren't they showing the fruit of the Spirit? The Bible says there's going to be fruit of the Spirit, right? It says specifically, these are the fruits of the Spirit. These are the fruits of unrighteousness. Take the two, apply them to the life. What do we see? Hmm. Interesting. The Bible tells you how to look for these things. But you've got to read the Bible to find it. And this is the problem I see today, is not enough people are reading like they should. They're going and watching a 45-minute YouTube video, getting a couple of scriptures, going and reading those verses and go, yep, makes sense to me. And then they never go any further. They never read five verses above and five verses below. They never do word searches. They never look at the Greek. They never look at the Hebrew. They never go any further than that one verse that that person showed them. Why are you picking a YouTuber to tell you what the Bible means? That's a mistake. Don't trust any of us. We're answering a call. That's it. it. The whole idea was to inspire you to go read the Bible. But you won't know these things if you don't. Who is this? This might actually be. Oh. Anyway, um. It's all in there. It all talks about this. Now back to the original subject, once saved, always saved in eternal security. Once saved, always saved isn't in the Bible, just like the rapture isn't in the Bible. However, the concept is, for once saved, always saved, it's eternal security. Once you are saved, you are saved. The whole, the whole understanding is contained within that statement. Once you are saved, you are always saved. The problem is you got to get saved first. And this is where a lot of people fall short. Now, a lot of people call this a damnable heresy and all that. No, it's not a heresy. Even David, David Wilkerson is wrong in his assessment of that. It's not a heresy from hell. It's in the Bible. It's people have taken it and misused it. They've taken it and used it as an opportunity or as an excuse to live whatever life they want to live, to live a life of excess, which the Bible says not to do, to live a life hating others, which the Bible says not to do, to live a life attached to the world, which the Bible says not to do. People use once saved, always saved to be able to do the things they want to do. I believe I'm good. And there's a lot of people on YouTube preaching that. I separated from that group. This is another reason. They're turning this into a doctrine and they're worshiping it. And it's not. Eternal security is the doctrine. John 10, 27, 29. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Let's go to John 10, 27, 29. Remember who John is. Right here. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. That includes you. That includes you can't snatch yourself out of his hand. You can't make enough mistakes or do enough wrong to be unsaved. You can't. That's the Bible. That's what the scripture says. Is what the Bible says. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. We cannot remove ourselves from it. We cannot lose our salvation. He'll fix us. He'll correct us. All the Father gives me will come to me, and uh, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. John six thirty seven. As you've given him authority over all flesh, and he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. John seventeen two. I have manifested your name to the to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. John 17, 6. On and on and on. It just keeps going. If this is what he's saying, why are so many people saying once saved, always saved is a lie? Well, it's because they don't understand. that that's, that's an acronym that is referring to eternal security. But because they didn't keep it eternal security and they changed it to this acronym, people are using this acronym as an excuse to live the life they want. Now we've got a bunch of people who recognize there's a problem, but they're taking it the, all the way to the other side of the football field in their understanding. 
Eternal security is not a damnable heresy. It's not from hell. Eternal security is in the Bible. It's the gospel. Christ died once for all sin. Done. It is finished. His very last words on this earth as a human being. If that's the case, it's not up to us. Now, here's the secret to that. You have to be saved in order to have that. An amazing amount of people, I know this is a hard concept to grasp, but there's an amazingly high amount of people who aren't really saved. Yet, when you look at them, they look a model Christian. There's whole churches in this country. Whole churches. Full of people. Thousands of people. Not a single one of them has salvation. Any church you go to, the rough numbers come out to about 10% of that population is actually saved. And it's a line you have to cross. People come right up to that, but never cross over. So they get the taste of the Holy Spirit. They get a taste of the good things. They know about Jesus. They learn about these things. They're not from a place of, of being demonically influenced. So they have the testimony. It's the demon that can't give the testimony. So they have the testimony, but they never crossed over. If they would have crossed over and gotten the Holy Spirit, they wouldn't be doing the things that they're doing. They wouldn't be using the gospel and the Bible as a weapon against other Christians. They'd be out there preaching to those who need the gospel, which is what we're called to do. The Bible actually says quite specifically, do not hate your brethren. Do not rail against your brethren. Yet that's what they're doing. Watch out for those who cause divisions. That's what they're doing. Now, one of these people quoted me almost home prophecy watchers uh, link one of their videos. First of all, I can't believe that. That's very saddening that that's who they're choosing to follow. Um, because he, he absolutely doesn't know the scriptures. Uh, that guy's got more hatred in him than anything. And he says he follows the Ten Commandments. And I asked him straight up, well, why are you overweight then? Well, that has nothing to do with it. Well, actually, it is. Didn't they put fat people to death back then? People who are gluttons? Hello? You better lose some weight. And all they did was they took it and they, they said, oh, he's saying we're fat. No. I'm saying if you, you say you're following the Ten Commandments, you better get right. Because you're not. It also says, thou shalt not murder in the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, hatred is murder. Why are y'all hating on everybody? One look at your videos shows how much hatred you have for anyone that doesn't think like you. There's a problem there. So these people don't have the gospel. These people don't have salvation. Because the Holy Spirit will not do that to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in one believer doesn't attack the Holy Spirit in another believer. That's flesh. So we have to understand this. So again... If a person truly has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I cannot fathom, I cannot see how they could possibly go headlong into these things. To me, there has to be a disconnect somewhere. Where they got up to the line, never crossed the line. That's how they're able to go into that. They're able to be willfully led into that. A demon cannot lead Holy Spirit into a false dis uh, understanding. A demon cannot lead Holy Spirit into deception. Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. It's impossible. Now, you may get yourselves caught up in some things, and then the Holy Spirit will bring you out of them. But at some point, there has to be a change. We've got people that have been on here for five years plus, doing the same thing and never changing. There's a problem there. I know that's unpopular to say, oh, how, how can you judge their salvation? I'm not. I'm looking at their fruit. Their fruit says they're not saved, according to the Scripture. The Scripture tells you, it gives you everything. Hate me if you want to, I don't care. The fact of the matter is, what's going on right now is wrong. Now... Let's move them to the side. Let's talk about the uh, once saved, always saved group. This is a separate group. It, there's an intermingling in this group. There's people that don't fully understand what it is, but they like the way it makes them feel, so they, they stick with it. There's a group of people who do understand what it is, that it's eternal security, and how it's to be used. It's this, there's no license to, to allow you to do whatever you want to do. But there's a large portion of this group that are taking this and using this as an excuse to draw more people in. I'm going to draw more people in and uh, get them saved with this doctrine. When that's not how it was meant to be. There are uh, uh, events where uh, Billy Graham, was he, he would have 100,000 people in a stadium and lead them all to Christ. Look at all the people Billy Graham saved. You know probably 2% of that 100,000 actually received it. He didn't save all those people. Most of them people, 99% of them people, 98% went right back out to their same lives. Oh, that was great. And went right back to the same thing they were doing. Many of them left. Men 
Left, straight to a strip club. Bar. Got drunk. Went to Hooters. Messed with them girls there. Many of the women, straight out to their girl's house, busted open a bottle of wine, and talked about how they how they felt so good and it was so much fun getting drunk. That's, that's, there's no change there. Look, there's going to be a change. You're going to have immediate conviction and you're going to want to change the things in your life. That's from the Holy Spirit. And it's going to lead you to the truths that are contained in the Bible. It's going to change your emotion. It's going to change your attitude. It's going to change your view on a whole lot of things. If there's no change, there is no conversion. You convert from one thing to another. You transform from one thing to another. You are born again from this to this. This is a hard concept for a lot of people to happen, or grasp. That's part of the reason why the, the path is narrow and few there are to find it. It's not because it's hard to find. It's because they don't want it. They're not willing to do that. They still People still want their shiny new sports car. People still want their great big gigantic house that they don't need. People still want all these things of the world. I just had it happen to me uh, over the last two days. And I was like, no, that's not the right way to, to handle this. It, it's People still want all their crap. They still want all their junk. They still want to have their fingers attached into the world. They're holding on to that bar, a safety bar. And they're reaching out for God, just in case they fall. Let go of the bar and fall. He'll catch you. That's a leap of faith. So we have a bunch of people that are, that are saying they believe in once saved, always saved, but they're using it as a license to stay attached to the world. Oh, you believe you're good. Don't worry about it. And there are a lot of people, I did a video talking about this, where they're asking questions and nobody's answering them. You believe you're good. No. There's more to it than that. That's not just it. That's coming in the door, but then you're standing in a room where you don't know anybody. What do you do from there? At some point, something has to change. At some point, something has to happen. Uh, we did that one. We did that one. John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. That's eternal security. You are eternally secure. Once you're saved, you're saved. And there's a ton of scriptures. I'll link this in the description. You can look at all these. I don't want this to be a super long video. You can look at all these. Tons of them. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and 10. It's not us that saves us. It's God that saves us. So if God saves us, we stay saved. He'll get you. You may not have anything when you get there. You may not have no inheritance in the kingdom when you get there, but he'll get you. He doesn't do this lightly. And this is where people make the mistake. They think that you, you're powerful enough, as a man or a woman, you're powerful enough to circumvent God's power. No, you're not. These are also people who don't believe the whole word of God is true. Don't you think God's powerful enough to keep this word accurate throughout all time? If you don't believe him, you have no belief in anything. You're struggling just, just with that. You've got to make a decision. Do I believe the Bible is true or not? You get rooted in that truth, then you can move forward. A lot of people don't do that. They listen to other people instead of reading for themselves. You're a lazy Christian. I hear people say all the time, there are no such things as lazy Christians. Oh yeah, there are. There's a whole lot of y'all. I used to be too. There's a whole lot of y'all that are lazy. You won't read the word for yourselves. You'll go watch somebody else's video and share their content. Or you'll take the, the references they give and you'll do your own video on those gifts. No. Do your own research. Read for yourself. Look at this. I'm up here. I'm digging into Pentecost and the Bride and the Galilean wedding ceremonies and how it applied. How it applies to the rapture. I'm doing my own research. You should have seen what I was working on last week. Some of y'all wouldn't even can even grasp this because this is going into the meat of the word. This is going into much deeper spiritual studies on this. And it's not because I'm trying to be better than anybody else. It's because I want to know more. That's where the Holy Spirit's leading me. But guys, this kind of stuff here, you've got to get this right before you can ever grow. This is all spiritual milk. Eternal security. Once you are saved, you are always saved. You never get unsaved. Here's the problem. you got to get saved first. That's why once saved, once you're there, you're good. A lot of people don't get there. That's the problem. And so that what they do is they take eternal security 
and deny it and call it a doctrine of demons, or they use once saved, always saved, which is eternal security, just it's, a, it's been rebadged. They use it as a license to do what they want to do. Oh, you believe you're good. There's a lot of people that teach that. I separated myself from that group because there's so many of them in there. A lot of them don't even realize they've gone that route. There is a walk that is associated with the believer. We are called to do the things that are pleasing in the eyes of God. Let's see. Deuteronomy 6.18. There's some New Testament stuff too. Let's see. Yeah. First Timothy two three. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why would he say be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? If all you had to do was get saved and there was nothing else after that, why was come to the knowledge of the truth put on there after that? Because there's something after being saved. There's a change. There's a move. What was the one in Deuteronomy? Oh, wait. Let me go back. I forgot I can use my referencing tool. So, 1 Timothy 5.4, But if any widow children... This is good and acceptable before God. He's talking about doing good things. Widows and the, child, and the, and the children. Romans 12, 1 and 2, See, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means you deny yourself the things of the world. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This is what happens after salvation. See, people don't read you these scriptures. They don't explain to you what this stuff means. This is the walk you have after salvation. It's a growth in this that's contained within the sanctification process that happens with every single born-again believer. There will be changes. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be attached to this world. Now, you've got to have some things. I've got a family. I've got to take care of my family. I need a truck. I need a tractor so I can brush hog my back whole backyard here. Um, I need a lawnmower so I can go mow. Some of these things you have to have, but you don't idolize these things. You don't make these things your God. That's where a lot of people cross the line. Um, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is God's will for our lives after we're saved? Ask yourself and then go look it up. I'm already showing you, but Romans 14, 18, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Ephesians 5, 9 through 10, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. If we're already saved, what are we looking for that's acceptable to the Lord? That's our walk. I'm looking at my life. I need to get all this out of my life. That's not acceptable to the Lord, but this is. So this I'm going to keep in there. Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Philippians 4.18, indeed I have all, is that, yeah, it is Philippians, uh, full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet selling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Guys, so far, every bit of this is talking about things that we do after salvation. But there's a lot of people using once saved, always saved. Get saved, don't do nothing else. Just kick back, relax. I got salvation, I'm good to go. And then when you stand up there at the Bema seat, and everything you've done in your life goes up in smoke, don't complain. Because it was your lazy self that didn't read the Bible. Colossians 1.10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. That you may walk worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing Him. Being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Is anyone looking at this scripture? Is anyone understanding what this is saying? I'm going to read it again. Do your own study on this. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
there's still more. First Thessalonians 4 1. Abound more and more just as you received of us ought to walk how you ought to walk and to please God. We walk in faith, right? What, what happens after that, though? Did these people get saved and then just go sit down and, whoop, I'm going over to the Jordan, I'm going to chill out and wait till I die? No. They got up and they went and did stuff. They changed their lives. Hebrews 13, 16, But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Every instance they're telling them, go do something. This is part of your walk afterwards. A lot of people like to keep, I'm saved. Once saved, always saved. They keep all their money to themselves. I'm saved, but I want to be rich too. They're attached to the world. You can't please God and be attached to the world. The scripture says, being friends with the world is at enmity with God, son of disobedience. Being enemy with the world is friends with God. You have to have some kind of separation. Something has to change. 1 Peter 2, 5, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 20, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Let's go over here to Colossians 1.10 and do a little contextual reading. Yeah, I said contextual. Okay. Let's go up five verses at least. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's the middle of a thought. Okay, let's go to the very beginning here. Verse 3, Colossians 1. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also to all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God is truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Notice that word servant. You know, Do you guys know what the word servant means? Look up the definition. That will help you understand too. You call yourself a servant of Christ. Why aren't you serving? Who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, is sitting in one place just believing, walking with worthy of the Lord? No. You please God with your faith. Now everything after that that you do pleases God to a certain degree. You don't get a gimme on sin because sin's still present. Your record is wiped away. Your debt is paid. But you don't get a gimme to go and do whatever you want to do and live how you want to live. You're not your own. What does the scripture say? You are no longer your own. You belong to someone else. Jesus paid for you with his blood. You're now attached to him. You're a servant of Christ. You're now a prisoner of Christ. You're a slave of Christ. To do his will. He tells you what his will is. He gives you parables. Good and faithful servant, bad servant. What happens to the bad servant? I'm going to cut him in two and appoint his, por appoint his portion with the ungodly. The Bible's pretty clear. <laughs> that don't mean you lose your salvation. But you might not like what comes. Fully pleasing him, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the God here fly, of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So they're putting a separation between forgiveness and salvation and the walk we have. And this is just the first part of this. There's so much more. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fruitful. Look at all this stuff for fruitful. John 15, 6, this is a good one. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, 
get up and get busy, Christian. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give you. Now, this is going to be different for everybody. Don't, don't understand that there's guidelines to this. There are no guidelines to this. There are some people who can't physically do anything. Their health limits them. However, that puts you in a perfect position to be a prayer warrior. Prayer is important. God covets prayer. So whatever is your reasonable service in this life after you're saved, that's what you do. And you go to the Lord with that stuff. Far too many of you are relying on YouTubers to tell you what this stuff means. You need to go and look it up for yourself. It's free. It's not like you got to pay something or you got to work hard to get it. He made it available. Free. Galatians 5, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now that's for the works heretics that constantly, oh, you got to have works to be saved and stay saved. No, you don't. You got the fruit of the Spirit. There's no law over you. Faith and love, man, that's it. 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, it froze. Uh-oh. Oop, there it goes. Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. People always forget when they quote Ephesians 2.8.9, forget to add verse 10. You add verse 10, adds a new dynamic to that uh, those set of scriptures. Philippians 1.11, Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. We're all called to this. And it's different for every one of us because all of us have different lives. Some of us are bedridden and can't get out. You're a prayer warrior. You have perfect opportunity to stay in prayer constantly. Some of us have the ability to do physical work. I mean, it's different for every one of us. I did physical works, and now I'm in a position where I do more prayer than I do anything else. He called me to do this. It's different for all of us. So, let's get rid of that. So, once saved, always saved, eternal security. Eternal security is what the Bible says. Once saved, always saved was born off of that. It's been turned and twisted into something else. They're turning it into lasciviousness. What does the Bible say about that? They corrupt the word of God. They take the gospel and turn it into lascivious, the grace of God into lasciviousness. It was talking about believers. That's in Jude. Let's see. Right here. Jude 4. 1 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness. King James's lasciviousness. And deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Lewdness. Let's look that up. You turn it into lewdness. See, you guys are seeing how to do this. It's so easy. Lewdness, crude and offensive in a sexual way. Vulgar, crude, smutty, dirty, filthy, obscene, pornographic, coarse, tasteless. You get the idea. Off color, unseemly, obscene. So, we're reading that scripture, and he's talking to believers in this chapter. This whole chapter is to, to believers. This is happening right now. This is going on right now. We have two, at least two camps, maybe three, that are doing this. And there's a few people that have pulled out and are standing over here separate. And we're all kind of finding each other. And we're like, guys, this is wrong what we're doing. It's gotten to the point where they're taking once saved, always saved, and making it a license to do all kinds of weird stuff. And that's not what it is. And, but it, what's terrible is a lot of people don't even know they're doing it. They're getting into the flesh. It's a dangerous place. So, eternal security is biblical. Once you're sealed and saved, that's it. The problem is you've got to get there first. Get to the salvation first. And a lot of people think if they confess it, that's it, they're good. No. You have to actually believe. There must be a conversion within you. 
A lot of people don't like this. That's okay. You don't have to like it. It's still true. Just like a lot of people don't believe in the rapture. It don't matter if they believe in it or not. It's still true. That's where that saying, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Whether you're there to hear it or not is irrelevant. That tree still makes a sound when it hits the ground. That's what that, that's what that saying came from. doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter your understanding. That means nothing. That's inconsequential and irrelevant. The things of God still stand. In 10,000 years, they'll still be standing. In a million years, they'll still be standing. So, people put give, they give themselves way too much credit on these things. And it's terrible what they're doing because they're taking simple, wonderful concepts like once saved, always saved. It's, it brings people in. But what it does is it doesn't explain to them what happens. Just believe. And you got it. Woo! I'm going to read this off. Oh, what was that verse? Oh, yeah, I'm going to read that off. Yeah, I'm saved. So it's all here. It's all here. It all feels good. But nothing ever happens in here. That's a problem. So that means if you've led, oh, in your lifetime, if you've led 500 people, Depending on how you did it and who actually believed it, you may have only led 50 people. The percentage is very low. The Bible talks about this. So, once saved, always saved is true. But you got to get saved. Once you're saved, then you're always saved. I never hear anybody explain this. And all I hear on the other channels is they're just constantly regurgitating the same thing over and over and over again. It never changes. It's the same thing over and over. All these live streams, all these people getting in there, they're all praising in the chat, and I'm listening to the message, and it's like, are you going to say anything else? This is the meat of the word. Okay, subject change. Repent. Here's another thing somebody was going on about. We should be repenting daily. No. You should not be repenting daily. There's two reasons why I say that. Because there's two different frames of thought on this. There's also confession. People confuse repentance and confession. I repent of my sins daily. Really, tell me what. Tell me the process. How, how does this work? You boil water and you know put on gloves and get out a scouring pad. How, how do you do? How do you do this? And uh, one person responded one time. They're like, I go into prayer and I tell the Lord, Lord, I repent of my sins that I've done today. I was like, so, okay. So what did you tell him? You changed your mind about your sin? Well, no, that's not what that means. I give him the verse. It's actually that is exactly what it means. All you got to do is go look it up. Repent. Let's go into the King James Plus. Now, in the Old Testament, they use several different words for repent. To sigh, that is, breathe strongly, by implication, to be sorry. That is, in a favorable sense, to pity, console, or reflexively rue, rue the day, or unfavorably to avenge oneself, consort self, ease oneself, repent, repenter, repenting, repent self. You're giving up what's going on. Now, in the Old Testament, it was a little different. You go down to the New Testament, and look what happens. Because we're under the New Covenant, right? Now look what happens. It changes to a different word. Metanoeo and metanoia. To think differently. To think differently? Because there's people still saying, no, it doesn't mean change your mind. Well, to think differently, isn't that changing your mind? Or afterwards, that is, reconsider. Change your mind. Morally to feel compunction. In no way is any of this relating you to going into prayer saying, Lord, I repent of my sins. Here's what's happening when you do that. And you guys, nobody's ever explained this to you. I'm going to explain this. If you get on your knees and you go to the Lord, Lord, I repent of my sins that I did today. Amen. All you did was tell him, Lord, I changed my mind. I reconsidered my sins today. Now you get up and you go right back into those sins. What have you done? Hey, Lord, I reconsidered this. I changed my mind. You read what the thing says. I th I th I'm thinking differently about this. Then you go right back and do the sin. He's sitting there going, why didn't you change the situation? Telling me you, you're going to change it doesn't mean anything. I want to see you change it. And they think that that's saving them. 
They think that that's helping them every day. You're literally doing nothing by saying, Lord, I repent of my sins, amen. All you're doing is letting him know, hey, I changed my mind. And then you don't change your mind. You don't do anything. You, don't, you guys need to remember, he can see in your heart. He knows what your real intentions are. Now, confession is different. You confess your sins to him. That's what you do in prayer. Lord, I'm going to make a confession today because I got really angry with this person and I had a lot of really hateful feelings. I'm sorry for that. That was bad and I shouldn't have done that. Please have mercy on me. That's confession. That's where the forgiveness comes from. Well, you're already forgiven. But you're, well, what is the scripture? It's in there. It's, you're faithful and just to confess, I'm faithful to confess. Yeah, if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Rep that's not repent. James 5, 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person has great power while it is working. Proverbs 28, 13, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. So it's, it's about confession, not repentance. Acts 3.19, repent therefore. Now listen, because a lot of people use this one and they weaponize it. See, you've got to repent of your sins. That is absolutely not what this is saying. Look, repent therefore, turn again, sow your sins, that your sins may be blotted out. There's three different things happening here. Now think about it like this. Let's put it in real life terms. You're cruising down the highway. And like down here, and you see a big exit coming right off here on Highway 10 outside of Seguin. That's where uh, the 130 toll road comes in. Big, huge ramp up there. I mean, you can't miss it. You're cruising along, throw the blinker on, start to get over into that lane and realize, whoa, that's not mine. I don't want to get on the 130. I'm trying to go down to Luling. Pull that signal back off and you swing back. Okay, so here's the process. You put your blinker on. You start heading down that path. Realize it's the wrong path. Ooh. I changed my mind. That's not where I need to go. I need to go another two exits down, three exits down, five exits down. Do you continue to go down that ramp? Do you continue to get onto the toll road since you changed your mind? No, you don't change your mind and then keep going down the same path. You change your mind, put your blinker on, get back over onto the highway, and go down to the proper exit. So it's not just a fact matter of changing your mind. It's also changing your direction. It's not just a matter of you know what? I realize that's sin. And then not doing anything else, now you got to get away from it. Flee from sin. Remember? We talked about that. In fact, there should be a bunch of scripture on that too. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. There aren't a lot of people with a pure heart. That's 2 Timothy 2.22. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin as a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Flee. Flee these things. 1 Corinthians 10.14, flee from idolatry. Now, fleeing isn't fleeing isn't simply uh oh and turn around and walk away. Fleeing is throwing your hands up, going ah and running. I mean, like sprint and get away from it as fast as you can. Remember the video I did where I was talking about when John was in the bathhouse and Serenthus came in and he jumped up, grabbed his towel, and he fleed that place. He fleed sin. He ran from it. Several of us have done the same thing on this YouTube community thing. We flee these groups because these groups are teaching something not correct. They're agreeing with false doctrine. You can't agree with false doctrine. Oh, it's a secondary issue. Still a false doctrine. No matter what you think it is, it's still a false doctrine. And what are we called to do? Flee those things. Avoid those things. Have no fellowship with those things. I tried to help people understand they didn't want to hear it. Matthew 25, 46 blows their whole argument out of the water. Now, for anybody who didn't see morning prayer, I'll show you. Matthew 25. Let's go to King James Plus so we can get the Strongs. 
Matthew 25, where you at? Right here. Matthew 25, 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now here's a great example of people who don't read their Bible and understand. Somebody, or several people, threw that verse at me. This, this proves that um, annihilationism is true, because the Greek word for everlasting means age, and that implies that it can end, okay? That's not what it means. It actually says perpetual. That means ongoing. Also used of past time. Or past future as well. Eternal, forever, everlasting world began. So, first of all, they got the definition wrong. That's a completely different thing. Here's what's scary about that, is they didn't go and check the rest of it. Because this same exact Greek, Greek word that they said meant it can end is the same Greek word used for eternal life. So according to their logic, that would mean eternal life isn't eternal either. So their own verse, their, their challenge, blows their own argument out of the water. I don't even have to prove it. The Bible proves it all by itself. It's just such nonsense. But that's what they do. That's, that's how they think. I want to be right. I Don't dare tell me I'm wrong. Mm, well, I don't have to tell you you're wrong. But the Bible does. The Bible tells you you're wrong a lot. So, again, back to repent. It means a change of mind. Think differently. Reconsider. Let's check a few more out. This is all 33, G3340. And they went out and preached that men should repent. Now you apply the definition. And they went out and preached, this is Mark 6.12, went out and preached that men should think differently. That men should reconsider. That men should feel compunction. Change your mind. Go a different direction. Now, change your mind actually falls under metanoia. And that comes in there. But that's the two words used in this. So when you apply the definition, it makes sense, doesn't it? Repentance is the act of, I realize what I did, and I need to change my direction in life. I know what this, this is wrong now. You've learned this of your sin. Now you change the direction. Now the repentance happens at, at uh, salvation. You change your direction in your life. You no longer want to be unsaved, you want to be saved. You no longer want to walk in sin, you want to get your sins forgiven. Now, technically, throughout our, our walk, our sanctification, we walk in a state of changing our mind, constantly changing our mind about everything. But that's not the act of getting into prayer and saying, Lord, I repent of my sins, amen. Now you go into confession. You've stepped into the next stage. See, if you don't read the Bible and study these things, you won't know these things. And your walk will never grow. You will never go any further than what you are. You've got to be honest with yourself. And if you're not, you're the only one you're hurting. All right, let's look for the other versions. Let's see. So we can contextualize this. 3340, there it is, 3338. And this is a great example of this too. 2 Corinthians 7, 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I re perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. So here's what Paul is saying. And we just all we're going to do is use the definition of the word. This is metanoia. No, I'm sorry, this is metamalami. So, read the verse again. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not I do not care. I do not regret it. Though I did care and I did regret it. So I, technically there should be three then. Because there's a metanoia too. That must be further down. Let's go find metanoia. When you apply the definition, it makes all the sense in the world. No, metanoia didn't come up. Oh, I know why. I know why. Because it's Repentance. Okay, there we go. That's metanoia, repentance. 
Matthew 9 says, But go ye and learn what that meaneth. This is Jesus talking. Go learn what it means. Go do your research. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to guilt, to reversal, to decision of another's decision. Change your mind. So all three of these versions, the two versions of repent and metanoia and metamalami and repentance, they all mean the same thing. You need to reconsider what you're doing. You need to have guilt for this. Change for this. You need to make another decision. You need to go and take another path. I believe for repentance, that's the only word that they use for repentance. 41, 41... 41 41 Here's another one. Oh, this is a different This is for They don't have uh, Without repentance Not to be repented of That's the whole phrase Without repentance 41 41 41 Yeah, all 41 Okay, so repentance only has the one word So it's pretty clear What's going on here, right? See, when you, when you do the research, you understand. But when you let other people tell you what this stuff means, like if you're going up like that, she's going over there to Almost Home Prophecy Watchers and letting him teach her what the Bible says. And he's wrong. He does not know his scripture. He does not know his Bible. He doesn't know his Greek. He doesn't use his tools. The guy, the guy does not know what he's talking about. There's no salvation there. There can't be. The hatred that he shows to other people tells that. There's no love there. Fruit of the testimonies. Uh, Shelley Hall. Joan Martin. Joan Martin. She's hardcore hatred towards other people. I'm better than you and you need to be like me. No, I don't want to be like you. If that's what it takes for salvation, according to what you think and how you act, I don't want any part of it. I'm going to go to Jesus and get the real salvation. And they don't like that we talk about them. Well, how amazing is it that you guys are doing the same thing the Pharisees did to Jesus 2,000 years ago. And they wonder why we call them Pharisees. You fit the definition. Your very behavior does. But see, you've got shades on your eyes. You're blinded. You can't see it. Now, as born-again believers, we're all born-again believers, right? You, you, all you guys, you're born-again believers, right? Your natural desire is to want to do the right thing, to follow after the Lord, to make him happy. I want to make Jesus happy. How do I do that? Well, first of all, I start with faith. Believe and build on that faith. See, that's why it's salvation. Like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, it's God's grace and God's faith. The sanctification process, our faith builds. He justifies us so we have time to change. But the change has to happen. And when so many people miss what these things mean, I got people railing on me every day. There's a lot of people that are actually kind of in question. They're like, I don't know, this makes sense, but I don't know, all these guys over here. If that's what you want, go there. If you want to know what the word really says, over here. This is where the spiritual meat is. And we are not eating steak tartare. We're eating the old 96er from uh, the John Candy movie, um, The Great Outdoors. Some people will remember that one. All that gristle and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We're getting into the hardcore stuff here. We're getting into the deeper things. The Bible talks about that should be part of your walk as you grow. Luke 13, 3. No, I tell you, for unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. See, I don't have to give you my opinion on this at all. All I can do is show you what it says. The Bible proves itself. It's so easy. And all these people that are getting mad, it's funny because they're all talking about, well, at this timestamp, all this stuff that you said, I think you're wrong. I disagree with you. And then I go to the timestamp and, and I'm like, I'm reading scripture. So they're, they think the Bible's wrong? And they don't even realize it. There's hatred in their heart. They don't even realize what they're doing. And they're foaming up their own shame and making themselves look stupid by doing that. And I get them every day. Well, you misquoted this, you misquoted that. Oh, when I put it on the screen and read it from the screen, I misquoted it? Okay. Idiots. Idiot in the actual definition. 
Not the derogatory sense, since so many people lack understanding and discernment. This is how I use idiot. It's a stupid person. A person of low intelligence. That's what an idiot is. There's a derogatory sense and there's the actual definition. These are all the derogatory synonyms down here. But that's what an idiot is. is a stupid person. A person of low intelligence. These people aren't listening. They're not paying attention. They don't want to learn. They want to be an idiot. You can do the same thing with stupid when I call somebody stupid. Having or showing a great lack of intelligence or common sense. A stupid person often used as a term of address. See, now whenever called, uh, Tim in that live stream he did a couple weeks ago said, I had a spirit of stupid. This is what he was saying. Now he may have meant it in a derogatory sense. I don't know. Uh, but this is what he was calling me. You be the judge. Watch my videos. What do you think? Am I showing a great lack of intelligence or common sense? Am I telling you exactly what the Bible says about these things? So, this is a rocket science. This is easy. So what is repentance? What is repent? I just showed you what it was. And what the Bible tells you it is. It is you coming to a place where you're like, I no longer want to be unsaved. I want to be saved. I no longer want to be looking at the gates of hell. I want to be looking at the gates of heaven. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to change, get a new idea, a new path, go a different direction. I'm going to reconsider this because I don't want to go this way anymore. And in every instance in the Bible, it means the same thing. Just different versions of it, but it's all the same thing. Don't do this. Instead, do this. That's simple. I'll link this in the description. Now, confession. John, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You wonder why your life is so troubled? Why you have so many problems? Why you're constantly struggling? You're holding on to sin. And he's sitting right there next to you in the chair going, I'm waiting. Tell me about it. Come on. And all you got to do is tell him. That's it. All you got to do is tell him. That's what he's waiting for. Romans 10, 19. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. Here's that heart thing again. Romans 10, 9. Blows that whole stupid stuff that people have been saying out of the water. Did a video on this. Believe. The word is near in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we preach. That all that caps. That's quoted from the Old Testament. Even in the Old Testament, believing was the way to salvation. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it's funny. Every time I talk about this, there's two certain YouTubers that start doing videos trying to do damage control on <laughs> that. Trying to explain it away. The Bible's clear. The Bible's clear. You must have a conversion. You must have belief in here. This is where the understanding happens. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord is over all is rich to all who call upon him. It's so simple, a cave baby can do it. They try to overcomplicate this. They do the same thing with once saved, always saved. Overcomplicate it. I don't care what somebody says. I care what the Bible says. So when I hear somebody say something, like David Wilkerson, very respected. I have nothing but respect for the guy. He did this a lot longer than I did. Man loved the Lord. Amen. He misunderstood, because I listened to the video, he misunderstood what that is. It's not a doctrine of demons, yet it's a doctrine being used by demons. Because they twist it and they make it into something else. And they're tricking Christians. They're, it's all a battle to get us to stop worshiping God. How do you fix that? Go to the scripture. What does the scripture say? I don't say once saved, always saved anymore. I say eternal security. Because that's what the Bible actually says, eternal security. Same thing. But you can't twist eternal security. 
You can't turn that. You can't change that. You can't modify that to make it mean something else and make excuses with it. Because you go read the scriptures about eternal security, there are none with once saved, always saved. You read the scriptures with eternal security, you can't. You have to wrestle those scriptures to make it mean something, to uh, acknowledge the way you want to live and say that it's okay. Once saved, always saved, anybody can change it. Wording is important. That's why every single word in the Bible is meant to be there. <clears throat> Let's see. Notice 1 John 4, 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. you got to believe. you got to have that Holy Spirit. Confess the Lord and mean it. All this stuff I'll link in the description. Now, you guys can go through these scriptures yourself. Do your own studies. Now, look, and I can't make you guys do this. I can't make anybody do this. I can't force you. I can't force you to study these things. All I can do is recommend. All I can do is answer the call that I'm giving. Uh, back, again, back to Noah. Preached for 120 years. Nobody responded. A lot of people didn't even realize that. I had people tell me. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. Jeremiah, 40 years. He was known as the crying prophet. He was always in a state of depression. Elijah, always in a state of depression. Preached and preached and preached, and they were like, I get it. They got to get it too, and nobody got it. In fact, they hated him and hunted him down. But you know what was waiting for him up there because they fulfilled their, their testimony? Because they fulfilled their testimony, because they were faithful to the end. They had reward waiting for them. They had a triumphal entry into heaven. We're going to see those guys. So, as we close, let me ask a question. Everyone watching this is saved, right? You're saved. There's been a conversion in your life. There's been a change in your life. When the Holy Spirit indwelled, you saw things differently. You contemplated and understood things differently. And as you grew as a Christian, everything started to change. Your draw went to Him. Even if you got saved and was super excited and then kind of fell off a little bit. That's what I did. But that time frame to now, do you see where you drew back to Him? Or where He drew you back to Him? No. Yeah. Sanctification. Now you're on here and you're doing this. See, there's a lot of people that are doing this that don't understand why they're doing it. And they get on here and they do videos and they preach. Believe, don't do nothing else. Well, why are you doing videos? Because the Lord called me to do that. Isn't that works? Isn't that fruit? Well, and they try to start explaining it away. No, you can't explain it away. The Bible is clear. The scriptures are clear. Now you've got to look at your work and see if it's the kind of work that pleases God. Because not every work pleases Him. He doesn't look kindly on everything. He hates sin. We're called to hate sin too. When um, the tabernacle was in the camp with the Jews and they started to get back into the same old nature again, literally had God right there looking at Him could hear him talking because him and Moses would stay up all night and talk still going back into their same old sins and the more they drug into that the more it got God mad and the ground started to shake all the time and there was fire coming out of there I mean it was, you can read that in the Bible it was getting pretty bad to the point that Moses was like we got to move this outside the camp so they did they moved it outside the camp because Moses knew that if he didn't fire was going to come out of there was going to take everybody out because <laughs> that's how they were making God mad he, he doesn't just wink at this stuff even after you're saved you're saved your, your debt is paid and your record is wiped clean you're still sinning how do we reconcile that well God doesn't, doesn't suddenly change and say ah your sins are okay now no he still hates that sin you're grieving the Holy Spirit with that sin 
Now what do you do? You start getting into the truth. You start sanctification. You start moving closer to Him. You start to live a life that pleases Him. You live a life that's pleasing to God. And everything changes because of that. You're not going to be rich. You're not going to be perfect. Yeah, that's a good one. That's the devil's doing that right now. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And by testing you may discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Does God want you to continue to live in sin? Is that acceptable and perfect? Ask, you got to ask yourselves these questions. Take your life and go, hmm, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. You may, what is good and acceptable and perfect to God. Is what I'm doing acceptable to God? Oh, nope. Is what I'm doing good? Uh, nope. Is what I'm doing perfect? Nope. What do I need to do? And when he was what he's watching you, and when he sees you change, he's like, ah, oh, got him. He dip, takes that bucket full of uh, blessings and starts pouring them out more. And the more you draw to him, the more those blessings come. Let's see. Now, here's a good one. I'm glad this one popped up in this list. Hebrews 11.6, And without faith it is impossible to please him. People have weaponized this too. For whoever would draw... It's funny because it's the grace people that <laughs> weaponize this one. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews 11.6. We'll close with this one here. Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders attained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Notice a faith and a work contained together here. Offer the sacrifice, that's a work. But he had faith in that offering. By faith, Enoch was taken away, so he did not see death. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, this is your faith, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How do you diligently seek God? Read the word, that's one way. Change the things in your life that would draw you closer to him, that would you know, make him happy. That's another way. Notice what Noah did. Noah did by faith, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, move with godly fear, preparing an ark. Noah did work based on faith. Abraham did work based on faith. Now, it's not, these are things that happen after the faith. In every instance, these guys all had faith first. That's what starts. You get saved. Then the changes happen. Then you do things pleasing to God. And this whole chapter is all about this. Now, James 2. Since this is such a hotly contested deal. And there's one verse in here. Let's see. Because uh, they like to weaponize this one too. And both sides are weaponizing it. Oh, here it is. Faith without works is dead. What profit? What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Your faith can't save you. God's faith can. Now, see, there's a lot of stuff, and this goes to another video that I'm, I'm working on because I'm trying to get all my information together, but I've been really busy uh, about names being blotted out of the book. Now, I shared something on the community tab. It's way down there uh, that talks about that, too. Um, and there's a lot of stuff in here that seems to say that the person who does nothing in their Christian walk may have a problem. Don't know if it's going to be losing salvation. As far as I can tell, you can't lose it. Period. Done. That's it. But you could suffer a lot. 
you could go through a lot of problems. Now James 2 talks about that. You say you have faith, but what are you doing for God? You say you have faith, but what's changed in you? These are all the little hidden meanings that are underneath this. I did several videos on James, on James 2. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Show me that you have faith. Don't just tell me. Where's the evidence? And then he says, I can show you the evidence of mine. Here's what I was before. Here's what I am now. Here's what I did before. Here's what I do now. Where's yours? All I hear you doing is talking. A lot of people, they just do this. But there's nothing, no substance. There's going to be a change in you. People don't like evidence of salvation. Ironically, those are the same people who haven't been converted. There is no evidence of their salvation because they haven't been saved. And that offends them. Well, maybe you ought to go do some business with the Lord and get saved. You believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. I highly recommend you guys do a study on James 2. It's well worth your time to dig into this, as it applies to you, not other people. This is another mistake that we make as Christians. We take this stuff and apply it to other people. No, 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 no. You apply that to you. You apply it to you, and that will help you understand how it applies to other people. So if the demons believe, why aren't they going to heaven? Well, evidently, there's more to it than that, isn't there? First, salvation. Standalone, one-time, singular event. You get there first, everything changes after that. Then, up to that point, that life is gone. After that is a brand new life. And it's all over the Bible. I've beat this up and beat this up and explained this over and over and over again. And frankly, I'm getting very tired of doing it because it's the same argument. And it's the same people asking it. They just open different accounts and are different names ask the same questions. It's like, come on, guys, really? I, I literally can see that it's your alternate account. It's like, come on. So we'll close there on James 2, but take the time to study this stuff deeper as it pertains to you so you know who you are in Christ. The Bible says examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Well, if you don't ever examine yourself, how do you know? You want that doubt and that fear to go away? Examine yourself. Don't be afraid of what you might find. Because if you find that what you're doing or how you're living or whatever's going on isn't aligning with what the Bible says, that's your opportunity to fix it. But you'll never know if you don't go there. And there are a lot of people who are going to lose everything when they get to heaven. And there are a lot more people that are going to think they're good to go. And they're going to find themselves here. Infinite Rapture uh, says all the time, you know, there's a lot of Christians that are, are going to get left here. He's partially right. There are a lot of Christians who are going to get left here. But these will be uh, not born again people. Once you're born again, you become a citizen of heaven. These people that are going to be left here, that are calling themselves Christians, weren't saved. The Holy Spirit has to leave the earth. The restrainer has to leave the earth. That means everybody with the Holy Spirit is going to leave. People that you know that you didn't think were saved are going to be taken. It's going to surprise you. People that you thought were good to go are going to be left here. I'm eyeballing a few people right now that I'm kind of wondering if they might end up getting left here. I'm telling you, you can live a lifetime and not be saved. And think you are. And there's a lot of people that will be standing here going, uh-oh, I made a mistake. Why do you think the, the great multitude is so big? John said nobody could number them. Yet the church had a finite number. It's very telling. When you take all that stuff and put all that stuff together, it tells you a story. So we have to take closer looks at this stuff. And we most certainly cannot... Take what somebody else tells us what this stuff means unless we look it up ourselves. Pray to the Lord to give us understanding about these things so we know what the difference is and we know what they are. The Bible is clear. Very clear. But if you don't ever read it and study it, you're never going to know. And it's so easy. 
anyway, that's all I got, guys. I wanted to cover that. I wanted to get that out because a lot of people are struggling with this stuff. A lot of people are still, they're listening to other YouTubers. You know, if you keep listening to them, you're going to keep going on with what they say. There were a lot of people that last week or the week before, super supportive. Everything was good. They were very loving. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it's out of the blue. You can sense the anger and the hatred and frustration in their comments. And then they leave and go to another channel. Okay, no harm, no foul. See ya. And I'll see them in comment sections on other channels. And I comment, I'm glad you found a channel you like. I can't make you believe. I can't make you understand. All I can do is present you the information. Just like everybody else did in, in the Bible. But it's up to you to look at it. It's up to you to read it. It's up to you to research it and gain the understanding. That's your personal worship to Him. That's your personal walk to Him. Is you searching for Him. You can't do it off of my coattails or off my salvation. You can't attach your walk to my walk. You have to have your own. I love you guys very much. And the only reason why I do this the way I do this is because I care. Because a lot of people are going to be very upset. Here pretty quick. And there won't be anything anybody can say to change it. They'll have to make the change then. They won't have a choice at that point. See you guys in the next video.